think about your first impression of me right now? Would it be different if I had a foreign accent? What if you saw me in a different space, say in public, walking down the street? What if I came today wearing this headscarf? Would your impression of me have been different then? Be honest with yourself. I think if I was sitting where you are now, my opinion might have been different. I imagine your first perception would be different of me depending on whether or not I had a headscarf on because I did wear the scarf for over eight years from the ages of 18 until 26. And I noticed a drastic difference between the way people treated me and perceived me when I had the scarf on. Today, I'm gonna to tell you a story about what hijab and headscarf means to me, about the factors that played a role in my decision to wear it, about my experience while wearing it, and my decision to stop wearing it. I'll call this my before, during, and after. But I have to warn you, this is not a conventional linear story. You might predict I'm going to tell you something like, I used to wear it, now I don't, now I'm free. That is not at all how this is gonna go. <laughs> With almost 1.6 to 2 billion Muslims in the world, estimated, there are a lot of interpretations about hijab. I'll give you my understanding of it, and I'll even tell you how that's changed with time. But in return, I ask that you keep in mind that I'm not speaking for all 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, or all American Muslims, or even all women who wear the scarf, called hijabis. So here's who I was in my before phase. As a preteen and a teenager, as I grew up in the Chicago area, I had been thinking about wearing the scarf. I was the type of kid who, if anyone told me what to do, I would want to do the opposite, <laughs> including my parents. Actually, probably, especially my parents. Just to prove to people and remind myself that I was the boss of me, even as a preteen. My parents never told me to wear the scarf, probably because they knew this, but also because they knew it was a personal decision that I would have to make for myself. Now, you might have noticed that I use the term hijab, headscarf here instead of hijab, and I'm using these two terms separately. I'm doing this on purpose. We often use the term hijab to mean headscarf, but it doesn't actually translate so easily. Hijab is a part of modesty, which is an important value in Islam. Hijab includes a code of conduct and a dress code that applies to both men and women. And part of the women's dress code is the headscarf. So the headscarf is not hijab. It is a part of the larger umbrella of hijab. So anyway, my mom didn't wear the headscarf, but she did teach me by example the true meaning of hijab. She was outspoken and assertive at work, yet dressed conservatively and acted modestly. She taught me that to be modest does not mean to be passive. There's an argument out there, a misconception, that hijab and headscarf are tools to oppress women. Personally, I feel like the hijab frees me. It's about finding empowerment from within and not from one's sexuality. It means that I see it as a feminist tool because it means that I have the ultimate autonomy over who gets to see what. I have the responsibility to carry myself with modesty and self-respect, and I also have the right to be treated in the same way. Here are some findings from a recent study that may surprise you. 90% of American Muslims agree that Muslim women should be able to work outside the home. American Muslim women hold more college and postgraduate degrees than Muslim men. And American Muslim women are more likely to work in professional fields than women from other religious groups in the US. So as a preteen and a teenager, my parents were one influence on me. But then there was also society. When 9-11 happened, I was almost 12 years old. 
I thought about whether I could speak with you today without talking about 9-11, but I realized that I had to talk about it because the political and cultural climate that followed was transformative for me, for America, for Muslims in America on so many levels, and we're still living it. I'm referring to the sudden new spotlight on Muslims being portrayed as terrorist, violent, oppressed, jihadist, whatever that means, suspect, and always other. At the time, I knew I was Muslim, but I didn't see it as something that made me an other because it's, it wasn't visible. It's a set of beliefs. I attributed my brown skin to my Pakistani parents and heritage, and I didn't even know if I was Sunni or Shia. I learned those terms first on TV news. At the time, I was already kind of confused about my identity as a first-generation American, and I didn't realize it right away. But 9-11 would soon add a whole extra layer to my identity confusion. All of a sudden, I felt like I had to choose a side. Being American and Muslim simultaneously no longer felt like an option. On one side, I could choose to proudly and confidently express myself as a Muslim. Or on the other side, I could choose to hide or deny that part of my identity and maybe have it a little easier. When I say choose, I mean literally make conscious choices when middle school kids would ask me if I was Muslim or not. And when I would honestly answer yes, oftentimes they would label me with these terms. I learned very quickly to be assertive. And I also learned what side I would choose. My middle school society was telling me to choose a side in which I hide or I deny this identity. So naturally, I would do the opposite. Fast forward a little, I'm still thinking about wearing the headscarf. By the time I turn 18, I think that I could deal with the pressures that I may or may not face while wearing it, and that I could really use this religious reminder as I started college. From the day I started wearing it, it had a spiritual component for me. It was a political statement at times, and also a fashion statement, inevitably, because it challenged the standards of beauty. The meaning would change for me as I grew, and also on a day-to-day -day basis. On some days, I felt safer with it on. It was a reminder of God's protection. On some days, it felt political. I was a walking, talking, breathing, screw you to the bigots and the Islamophobes. I was a personification of my First Amendment right to freely practice my religion. And on some days, I didn't really think about it. I wore it because I had made a commitment. One effect that I realized I had while wearing it was changing people's minds. This is a part that I had a total love-hate relationship with because sometimes it felt like power and sometimes it felt like pressure. I had the power to affect people's perceptions of Muslims and show them what a Muslim was really like. For example, when I would stand up as an attorney against domestic violence and sexual abuse, it would automatically convey that as a Muslim woman, I'm against domestic violence. When I would have a conversation with someone, we would connect on a human level and bond over the similarities we had. I would humanize being Muslim for people, and I would normalize hijab and headscarf for people. And I loved this part. But sometimes, it felt like pressure. One morning, while wearing the scarf, I stopped at, uh, to get coffee on my way to work. I was really tired. It was early morning. It was gloomy outside. I had been up late the night before, which is totally my fault and Netflix's fault. <laughs> and I was just exhausted. I felt like I should smile. I was conscious of coming off as mean or cold to the girl who was making my, my coffee. Although if I had come off as cold, I would hope that she'd attribute it to me not being a morning person, it being early, not having my coffee yet. But deep down, I knew that there was a possibility that she may subconsciously 
maybe even unintentionally, attribute it to my Muslimness. I had all these thoughts circling in my mind. What if I'm the first or the only Muslim that she would ever meet? Maybe Trump's anti-Muslim comments from last week are fresh in her mind. That's awkward. Maybe she thinks Muslim women are oppressed and unfriendly. Maybe she would be surprised if I spoke to her in my American accent. I should appear extra friendly and nice to overcompensate for these negative stereotypes. Wait, why do I have to compensate again? Why do I have to care what someone else thinks of me? I mean, I guess I don't have to, but then am I not doing my part? Am I not exercising this potential power that I could have? All of these thoughts circling in my mind, in combination with the morning pre-coffee version of myself, caused me to end up not doing anything. I got my coffee and I left. Sometimes I'm just tired. The pressure was increasing and I felt suffocated. Suffocated partly from my own thoughts and having to think of my actions in terms of how will it look? How will it make Muslims look? but also suffocated from the increasing media attention on Muslims and the scarf. I still don't really understand why the scarf gets so much attention. It's a piece of cloth. Yes, it can be meaningful and important and symbolic, but it's a piece of cloth. Maybe it's because it's a shortcut way to identify some Muslims? I don't know. On some days, while running errands, I would wear a hat on my head if it was cold. Or, just to conduct my own little social experiment, I wouldn't cover my head at all, just to see. I learned very quickly that people treated me so differently when I didn't have a scarf on. I didn't realize how much people stared at me until they didn't anymore. I almost expected it. It's kind of like how we don't notice how loud it is in a noisy, busy restaurant until it suddenly gets quieter. It was weird. Meanwhile, my Facebook feed was a really annoying combination of the most recent hateful comment by some politician about the latest hate crime on a Muslim or someone perceived to be Muslim, and then Muslim scholars and chaplains telling us to be safe, to be careful, to take off the scarf or shave the beard if we felt like we were in danger because Islam prioritizes life and safety. I was torn. I didn't feel like I was in danger for the most part, and now was a great time to try to show people what a Muslim was really like. But I was so overwhelmed by all this pressure, and I was so sick of the attention. I was just tired. As you can see, I eventually decided to stop wearing the scarf just a few months ago. Now is my after. Will I wear it again? Yeah, I might. I would love to have the option. I might wear it soon. I might wear it later. I wore it by choice. I stopped wearing it by choice. And if I wear it again, it will be by choice. I'm not the exception either. Most people I know who wear it are wearing it by choice. In Islam, there is no compulsion in religion. Hijab, though, I still work on. It's kind of like trying to obtain happiness or improve our character. It's something that we continuously work on throughout our lives. So now I must ask you, think back to your first impression of me. Has it changed now that you know me a little better? Has my nuanced relationship with hijab and the headscarf affected your attitude towards it? If you see someone wearing it now, would you perceive them differently? The media and random people who don't know me try to tell you how I feel, what I believe, how I dress, what we Muslims think, how we act. The media does this not just with Muslims, but with all groups of people. We Muslims don't fit into this mold because even I, just one individual, does not fit into this oversimplified characterization. The media does this with all groups of people because we let them. 
Every group is the victim of stereotypes from outside the community and also within their community. So what can we do about this? First, we must acknowledge that we have implicit biases. I want you to take an honest look at yourself today and try to figure out what your implicit biases are. Only then can we work on opening our minds through understanding the complexities that exist in each individual's story. I challenge you to get to know someone who's part of a different community on a deeper level. They might even be sitting next to you right now. By listening to my story today, you've already done this once. Then we need to apply this mindset to larger communities, understanding that the multitudes and the complexities of one identity is representative of the beautiful diversity that exists in all communities. Ask yourself, after you get to know this person on a deeper level, whether your attitudes and opinions about their communities have changed, even slightly. Finally, we must know that change in the world starts from within, and we can start to do our part right now. I love this quote from Rumi, in which he said, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I am changing myself. Thank you.